Jade. Hi, and welcome to the Skeptical Leftist Podcast, the show where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Jessa McLean from Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining me. I'm glad to be here, Corey. So I guess one of the first things I have to always ask is, uh, who is Jessa McLean? My, you know, I had someone ask, I think it was my mom. She's like, if people ask, what do you do? <laughs> I'm like, well, that's a very complicated question. It depends on who's asking. Uh, you know, I'm a bit of a political analyst, um, but mostly I'm a shit disturber, right? My, I cut my teeth organizing largely in political circles and uh, workers' rights, and now I do a podcast, actually two, so Blueprints of Disruption and one called Rabble Rants, whereas I get to mm-hmm. vent. It's more of a vent than anything else. But yeah, um, I think I've seen myself tasked with, you know, holding particularly left-wing politicians uh, accountable. Uh, more so than anything, and and showing folks the movements that they should be putting their energies into, rather. Yeah, you've had some on your show, uh, like some people who are in tenants organizing or labor organizing, or you've had like a variety of media people on talking about, you know, progressive stuff, basically, a leftist stuff. I, uh, I, I just listened to two episodes in a row, (laughs) because <laughs> I was a couple behind and you had both the guy, the uh, Alex from the Maple yes, and Alex some Bush. folks from Unicorn Riot. And that I thought that was very cool. <laughs> yeah, I really like talking to Unicorn Riot because although it, it's a media company and we usually talk to organizers and activists on how they do what they do and, you know, try to get tips so folks can really get into the game and and, and do something. These folks, uh, the way that they were structured really spoke to me and some of the limitations like that people are putting on themselves. Uh, they're a bit of an anarchist collective. Like I, I asked them, are you guys anarchists? Because I'm reading your bio and I'm seeing what you do. <laughs> and, you know, they kind of they don't look at each other because it's online, but, you know, they're going to, mm, well, you know, uh, we don't like labels. And, right. <laughs> but it is. It's kind of embracing that, you know, everybody has a role to play. And who are we to kind of narrowly dictate a path forward? So, right. yeah, they were fun. And uh, the Maple, I mean, if folks aren't subscribing to the Maple, uh, you're really missing out on what's really going on in Canadian politics. Uh, finding out Trudeau is completely lying about the arms embargo from Alex was, right. you know, not surprising, but it's so important to have fucking receipts. And like, because sure. they can just tell us anything. And how are we going to know whether or not they've signed some contract for mortar shells out of some firm in Quebec we've never heard of, but not through us, through the Pentagon? And it's like random press release is the right. way we find out. Yeah. And the fact that we have like an Alex Kosh working on it. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny to think like they I I always assume politicians are lying. But <laughs> but I, it's good to see the evidence that they're breaking even their own rules and even their own statements and they're like they're saying one thing while doing another. It's it's good to have that evidence for like the masses, I guess. Yeah, I know like you might feel crazy saying everything the government says is bullshit, but you know, there's always that kernel that you're right in there. Like you're never getting a hundred percent the truth. And, and sometimes you're getting bold face lies and yeah, Yeah. independent media is how you're going to find out about it. I'm sure. Uh, So I guess what are some of the, I guess, what was the impetus for blueprints of disruption? Where did that come from? Well, I burnt myself out royally in partisan political circles. So I ran as a candidate for the NDP, but then, you know, you kind of gone behind the curtain. So then my mission became to organize within the party to change it. And I think everyone has kind of gone, (laughs) whether they've done it or not, you know, they've definitely thought about it. You know, if we could only recapture that workers party. So I thought I could do that you know, ran for party president um, and really got behind the curtain. And then when I left, 
well, they actually kicked me out. Um, but I had stepped back at that point. Obviously, I was trying to burn it down from within at that point. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be fair. Um, but I needed then to plug people in. I honestly felt a level of guilt in pulling so many people into NDP spaces. I mean, I, oh, you know, yeah. I ran a lot of campaigns. So my local folks, I asked to believe in the party. I went and ran for, you know, Ontario NDP positions, federal NDP positions. And I asked people to help me there and promised them like that we could change things. And it, it, we failed. Like it didn't work out. Failed before us. No, and it was harmful. It was yeah. really harmful. Like they really are. Like you've seen. Like some of it is publicly. Like we've seen MPs or MPPs just com- treated horribly because they've taken outside party lines. Yeah. And yeah, they're very, very cold and callous, especially in the dark. You know, to members that not everybody knows. So I wanted to show people that you can still be politically active. You can still use all those skills you use on those campaigns. Your donation dollars, if anyone has any left over, can go into way more effective spaces, yeah. like community organizing, tenant organizing, workplace organizing, uh, other things like just disruptions. You would be yeah. far more effective going out and shutting thing intersections down than going door to door for your NDP. I It always makes me think of the, the Green uh, Party. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I always have to make that disclaimer because someone will ask me, what do you think about the Green Party then? Is there hope? They they want a path in right. electoral politics. And I was like, there is none for you. Not right now. Yeah. Uh, save your energy. Yeah. I, uh, it always makes me think of the uh, the unification of means and ends that you read about in anarchist theory. is like the, the means you use will determine the ends you get. And if you're using electoralism or party politics or bourgeois politics, however you want to say it, you end up in a bourgeois system, a, 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 a hierarchical power system that won't change and will, in fact, change you. Absolutely. Like a lot of people take that Machiavellian approach with very honorable goals. Yeah. <laughs> they are trying to get where we want to go, but they really do believe that they or someone they know needs to be in that position of power. So whatever right. we need to do to get there is is okay. Um, Chris Hedges also wrote a book called, I'm going to get it wrong, like Revolution no war does it change us Frank, i'm not going to get the title right but anyway <laughs> okay. its premise goes through various revolutions and just like you said the things that you need to do sometimes it's you know teaming up with some people who have access to resources you need yeah. to stage a revolution and does that change your makeup absolutely when you commit certain crimes perhaps that would definitely change you not just as a person but as a movement um there's all kinds of things and it can be as simple as using boardroom tactics right and becoming that boardroom or then at least being surrounded by people who are ineffective because anybody who rises to the top has to make some concessions and maybe there's exceptions but but i'm telling you there's not even the best people <laughs> that you guys can think of out there in Canada, Canadian politics, I can tell you a horror story about them. And I'm so sorry. And if you want them, I have them, but there's not one. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Jamma might be an example, but even then. But that's why um, she's getting the treatment she's getting, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, even folks like Fred Hahn here in Ontario who – are very principled, uh, might have stories behind them. I'm not going to shit on Fred Hahn today at all, but right, he seems look, to be getting piled on yeah. anyway, so. He's sitting on an executive that just voted 19 to 1 to to have him resign. He's refused. Mm. But he, he's looking around him and there was not, there was only one person there willing after all this time he spent in that union and all this time he's been like fiercely advocating for Palestinian liberation. Uh, there was only one person that would would stand behind him and so yeah politics is a dirty game and that includes union politics a lot yeah yeah i uh yeah it's it's one of those things like i always uh i still am pro union right but in the sense that like they're necessary to get us somewhere (laughs) in a lot of in the workplace i guess 
but like uh they're not what i rest my like political theory on (laughs) yeah there again like in theory absolutely we need to organize into unions yes that should include your workplace is like the structures that we have right now or the institutions that we have right now, are they ideal kinds of unions? Like, no, no, right. they're structured just like the political parties. Their conventions right. are just as problematic as those po- political parties. Their need to maneuver na- through narratives that ha- should not be related to their jobs at all. And I don't mean Palestine. I mean, having to navigate that kind of uh feedback, you know, you should just be able to plow ahead. If you're voted in by your members on very clear things, like you should be able to, to just do your, your thing until your tenure with with some safeguards. But it's just ridiculous the energy that good leaders then have to spend uh, playing that game of politics. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> through necessity. I was thinking, uh, I guess, sort of, sort of back to your show. Um, as I was listening to you talk to like, like maybe this is kind of like a po- inside podcasting, <laughs> but I was listening to your conversation with the unicorn riot. And I was thinking like, how, how do you, do you get nervous? And do you, how do you come up with the questions that you come up? No, I don't get nervous interviewing someone. Sometimes I get uh, nervous going on legacy media. Uh, okay, because you yeah. really have to think of what you're going to say, whereas I am very much myself on my podcast, <laughs> and right. I am genuinely picking the brain of fellow organizers so I can figure out how to maneuver through the, a revolution. <laughs> this right. is this is what I'm doing. And so you'll find even my questions have shifted. Like, I don't know what, how many episodes we're at, like 170 or something. And... I've changed, right? I've maneuvered how I've thought and it's kind of been a personal journey. So sometimes the questions are quite selfish. They're based on, (laughs) you know, how can I maximize my output as an organizer or maybe as a podcaster specifically? But usually I'm thinking as an activist and I just, those are my genuine questions for those people like, and I try to make it a real genuine discussion. So I might have a plan for questions Right. But the discussion goes elsewhere and I need to unpack things that they say. And so it it naturally comes up. I mean, there's been some interviews where I feel like I've got like someone to come on that I've tried really hard to get to come on. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But no, I think I'm past the nervous public speaking thing. It's just been something I've done for so long now. Right. Yeah. After yeah, being in the actual public eye, like I, for years I did podcasting, but not with any video. And then when I started go, transitioned into video, I was always very like self-conscious, I guess, is the idea. I don't often record video, so I don't <laughs> have that extra. Um, and my partner, Santiago Hulucantero, he never lets me record. If he hears this, he's even going to be upset with me probably. But, <laughs> you know, he's very particular. The background's got to be, you know, how he wants it to be. But like, you can see there's clutter behind me. I, I don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> I don't wear makeup. I, I barely brush my hair coming down here. I apologize. But oh, um, it's, uh, yeah, that that is an extra level of things to deal with. But um, <laughs> I feel you. Yeah, yeah, I just when I, I talk to I try to talk to a lot of podcasters and sometimes YouTubers and it's it's always kind of a different conversation because podcasters are used to talking a lot, but YouTubers are always very conscious of like their surroundings, unless they're like one of those the ones who puts just an animated thing on their screen. But <laughs> I could have been a cat, you mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Well, I did shift my camera a bit. I was like, oh, you can see that little curtain that kind of hides half the room. So I was a little hyper conscious. I wish you could see my plants. But um, yeah, it's just a little nook in my house. I can't stress Um, too much about it. For sure. Well, I know like uh, I've uh, I guess I've spoken to Santiago before about uh, I was interviewed on New Left Radio a long time ago. A couple of years ago now. No, I'm <laughs> no, just kidding. Anymore. I'm kidding. But you wanna... yeah, that's, yeah. that's a story in itself. Maybe that'll be a post-show discussion. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, 
Yeah. So I, I've spoken to Santiago and and we've messaged on uh, Twitter a couple times before. I was going to have him on the show at some point as well. You definitely need to have Santiago on. He is an excellent writer on top of what you hear on the podcast and a genius when it comes to sound editing. Yeah. No, he, <laughs> he knows his stuff with sound editing. It's, it's, uh, no, he, your, your show sounds very, very professional, very good. Lots of uh, that is all him. I mean, yeah. I often have to edit uh, the content, <laughs> but then he saves me. He cleans it up. Cleans up the yeah. No, yeah, that's I try good. to take as many of the ums and ahs for my guests as possible. <laughs> try. I don't do that usually. I do. I cut out silences, but I don't do ums and ahs very much. <laughs> Sometimes you got to give up. You know, like I've had some guests <laughs> on, and you're like, just okay. I tried. I really tried, but I got to let it go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's fair. It's what it is. So I guess moving on from the podcast, <laughs> one of the other things that th I thought of while I was listening to you was how do you feel about the world? Like, are you, do you have a, a hopeful kind of like idea of what can happen? Absolutely. I mean, the world is shit, right? I think I say right. that to my family or I walk out the house going, you know, for a break going, I'm going to burn it all down. Uh, and everyone kind of fluctuates between this despair that comes from our material conditions and is valid, 100% valid. And I do feel it all the time. But I also talk twice a week, at least, mm -hmm. to people that are dedicating almost every spare moment to organizing their communities towards a better end in right. so many different ways. And so it would be impossible for me not to be hopeful when I see that, especially, you know, you have folks on rent strikes, right? Uh, making tangible victories out of seemingly nothing, you know, in places where it seems so obvious to organize, but not we haven't done that well in a long time. And there it has been a huge resurgence of people organizing where they are, mm. right? Not just at their workplace, which is, again, seems kind of obvious, but can be very difficult, but in their homes, in their apartment buildings, and then at, in their pastimes uh, as larger collectives that you hadn't thought of before, finding connections. Right now, a lot of it is out of necessity because it's all hands on deck to respond to the Palestinian genocide. And right. so you're seeing climate activists and labor activists and obviously Palestinian solidarity activists and Palestinians and indigenous activists leading these movements together. And yeah. if, if you can't look at that organizing that's happening right now and the waves that it's making and see like potential, like those connections won't go anywhere. The lessons people have learned on the streets right now they are going to just build on them. So, yeah, people are starting to find their power. You know, sometimes they're being pointed in the wrong direction. So you have the right wing also realizing their people power, yeah. which is sometimes the biggest mental hurdle. Unfortunately, they're attacking immigrants, migrants, and yeah. using it this power to bad ends, you know, like a supervillain. But if we can redirect that, if it can be more obvious to them that, the 1% that capital is in fact the source of their woes, that energy and that defiance that they have for the state is actually a very healthy one. But um, yeah, they have got their values all turned upside down. <laughs> Individualism yeah. is just, yeah. I, it, 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 it's what weakens them. It's why they'll never be stronger than us though, because they don't understand the need to stick up for one another no matter what. So when they're in a tight spot, they can't guarantee their comrades if they have any will be there because it's like, well, what do I get out of it? Right. Right. What did that community ever give me kind of attitude? And so they can't really build and grow the way that we can because we understand that. Yeah. And so many of their 
their leaders end up being grifters that are stealing their money or, you know, so are ours. <laughs> well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but we, I think like the smarter movements don't look to leaders, especially yeah. singular, although it helps sell the brand, especially if you're talking partisan politics. For sure. But if you're talking partisan politics, those are fucking grifters. Yeah. Like they are literally emailing you in the deepest, darkest crisis and they are not pointing you to a picket line. They are not pointing you to a mutual aid outlet that can help you. They are asking for your money. Yeah. Right. And so massive yeah. red flag. Asking not, for, not a yeah. red flag, you know. <laughs> get a donate your one hundred dollars now and you, you'll get your tax deductible receipt. <laughs> <laughs> sign a petition sign a petition We're so beyond that now i mean look if you have to organize a petition to gather names around your community there's sure. value in that you that is a tool i'm not mocking the tool but like when it, when you've already got millions in an office and access to millions of people and yeah. that's still all you're asking from them is to auto fill a form uh you have not done your job right it's like a stall almost like uh they haven't progressed in, in any kind of like actual movement to change anything. No. And that's like by design and people don't want to hear this, but they exist to exhaust us both financially and mentally and contain us in what is palatable to capital, right? They're like those marshals that won't let you <laughs> disrupt to the level that you think is appropriate they are holding us back, right? They are yeah. pointing us in really weak pressure points, uh, you know, email campaigns and, you know, just handing our money over to them and expecting them to do that in the legislature by standing up for a sound bite. Right. Uh, but, you know, how much more powerful would it be if you just even saw one of those politicians stage a sit-in or participate in a disruption and take the heat for that to show them they're willing to do exactly what your regular Joe getting no money at all for this to be political. Yeah. They weren't sent there to a place of power with any kind of agendas. People like trying to find daycare for their kids, work their job, and then take to the streets. And, it, you know, they can't even look to their leaders to join them. Right. So, yeah, our leaders are... I mean, just as bad as theirs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I kind of, it's very strange. I think of like, yeah, like you say, like, if I'm getting paid to be political, then why am I not taking as much, you know, extreme action as I can, right? Like, it's not like your job hinges on it. That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you don't have to just take back door meetings. You don't have to put that shit on your agenda. You don't have to waste your time. You can go in a burn it down mentality to office, but they don't. Yeah. Right. Because like parties don't allow those kinds of people to run in the first place. That's just been right. shut down right across the board. And if they do, you know, they're ostracized immediately. But, you know, once you're there, you hold that responsibility. So you can look at every one of those and be like, why didn't you? Yeah. You know, once you were there, you're there. What do you got to lose now? Yeah, that's right. You get You've been elected. Yet? Maybe you won't get elected again if you do that. But like, yeah, you have a life like you had a life before you were elected. <laughs> oh, and they don't have any problem finding jobs after they've <laughs> right. been for office. So people are always like, but their jobs, that's not what it is. They don't worry about where their paycheck is coming from because the private sector has offered them the, you know, they all have jobs waiting for them. I'm telling you this. What they're worried about is a lot of them are narcissists or just full of themselves, and they think it's them. They need to be in that place of power. Right. They 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 hold the key to making it better. At least I'm talking about progressive politicians. And some of them are just straight up grifters. Like Jack Meat. Jack Meat does not believe he can change a fucking thing. I tell you, I tell you, this man has no vision. If anybody's ever spoken to him, it's just hollow words. Andrew Horwath was the same thing. No vision at all. Like yeah. none. So they're happy and content, just like cashing in. He became a landlord during the housing yeah. crisis. This man yeah. is not invested in working class struggle at all wearing a Rolex. When I found that out, that was where I lost any faith I had in him as a, a progressive leader in any sense. I was like, a landlord, eh? That's pretty bad. Yeah, like he didn't even care about the optics. I mean, he got his wife to put the name in her property. It's like that was supposed to be some sort of, 
it's still just disclosed in the House of Commons. And so we all know that Probably most just... of our politicians are landlords because <laughs> yeah. we keep electing people we think are better than us. Like, you know, clean right. up better, sound better, have a better LinkedIn, you know, than you. And this causes problems. It goes to their yeah. fucking head. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it means we're electing elites most of the time. Yeah. It's like, uh, uh, they used to always com- accuse the left of being in echo chambers or whatever. Like you'd hear that online discourse all the time back in before Trump was even elected. And like, uh, but it was, it's always like the people who will have the yes men, the politicians, the, you know, the, yeah, those who are placing themselves above us that always are in the echo chamber. They don't know what it's like to live a regular life anymore. They've got all these people around them being like, yeah, you're the best. You're the smartest. You're you're right about that. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's no good. Especially our leaders. I would say, though, your MPs, your MPPs or MLAs, wherever you are, in a lot of circumstances, especially with the NDP, they are kept in silos uh, mm. from one another as well. Is that right? So. You know, you got to imagine some of these people are going into this position for the first time. It's not your regular job. There is lots of ins and outs, but they don't work cohesively as a team, as you'd expect. When I've talked to them, the elected, especially those who've left and are willing to be open and honest, it's they lit. Yeah, they operate in silos, both removed from one another and generally from the public especially the membership. I mean, you don't give them access to a membership. They'd have to go out of their way to do that. And so they're not even a reflection of even that, forget the general populace, but even the people who are working with them or for them, Mm. um, who they're supposed to kind of be feeding off of to a degree. How does that make any sense? (laughs) I don't understand how that can work even. Well, it doesn't. Yeah. Clearly. Right. It doesn't. They cannot <laughs> gain power. And when they do, it's because they've turned themselves into liberals completely, like yeah. unapologetically, like in B.C., where uh, they have even some really right wing policies they've yeah. introduced and people don't like to talk about it because that seems really hopeless. Right. When you're like, well, like I get genuine replies in my Twitter that I feel bad. I try to answer them delicately as much as I can. Sometimes I just have to drop a podcast episode because like I have gone into it so many times, but, but then what do we do? Right. But then what do we do? Okay. Who do I vote for? They're desperate. Like they're literally going like, right. okay, who then? Cause I know what I heard what you said about the green party. So what do I do with my vote? And I say to them, you know, vote however you want. You got, if you feel like you got to vote, vote for me, it's consenting to a system that I don't agree with anymore. I'm a political yeah. science major. Okay. I bought into it for a very long time, but I, I don't, I, I'm not going to vote unless there's an independent candidate who needs, who needs me that right. respect, but vote how you want to vote, but just please stop putting your hope there and definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely stop putting your energy and money there. They don't deserve it and it won't change the outcome. It it will not. Yeah. We, uh, <clears throat> for the longest time I was in Regina, like looking for anybody who identified as an anarchist. Like I was searching online. I'm trying to find people all over. Um, and I finally found someone who used to be like into kind of organizing anarchist book fairs and stuff. And so I, I talked to them and I said, like I said, what, what happened here? Like, why can I not find any radical voices where where can, where are the people that are my people? And he says everybody was absorbed and transformed by the NDP here. Like <laughs> it, yeah. it, it it took all the radical energy out of this province essentially. So it, it's no wonder it turned into like a conservative haven. Yes, there are two outcomes. You know, you go in and you get absorbed, or they spit you out tired and damaged. <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah. there was a federal convention that we organized around my sense of years since like 2020 has disappeared. So I have no idea, but it damaged so many people that never returned to political yeah. circles again. 
they are in their communities doing what they, some of them, some of them left us forever. Um, but completely unable, unwilling to enter what, what people call politics now. Yeah. And that has been generational. It has happened over and over again. People are like, try to look to Jack as some sort of like, let's go back there. But I did an episode with Matt Fordor where he details the way Jack Layton transferred power from the membership into the hands of consultants and yeah. unelected staffers within the party and began a very, we called the episode deliberate turn to center. And it's been that way ever since. But like the anarchists, um, I think I'm finding more people adopting an anarchist perspective, even if they don't identify it politically. Right. What I mean by that is because I'm always looking at it again from like an organizer perspective, or at least I feel like that's my job, <laughs> even though I don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to answer this question that we have all this unused angst mm -hmm. in our movements and we're so used to circles like um, unions and the NDP where there's such limitations put on us and mechanisms and very official avenues of action. And we're so used to structuring ourselves that way that a lot of organizations have fallen into that pit. pit. And right. what they're having is this unspent energy or people, they're losing people. And the, the people that they're losing are the people that are most willing to push the boundaries. So it's not like anarchists from a like, like I, people have such skewed ideas of what anarchists are. Yeah. But if you think if you gathered all of these people into a room and said like, what do you want to do about X, right? We have to stop X, not Twitter. I mean, that's the shit show, but <laughs> we have we're to stop, stop that too. How are we going to do it? And you have like three different ideas you have people really enthusiastic and capable of executing three ideas. The best way to move forward is a true collective spirit where you don't know the right answer and you let people find their way, right? You yeah. have some limitations, so you don't let fucking fashion, right? You don't operate with cops. You don't operate with bigots. You don't leave space for folks to tramp on marginalized people in your groups. But you don't kick out anarchists who are willing to maybe stage a de-arrest. Mm -hmm. You don't tell people they can't be spray painting monuments because it's a bad look. Or, right. you know, try to contain everybody into your idea of what is palatable, of what will draw as many people in. And if you absolutely can't have like an anarchist element to your organizing, you should understand that you need a wing. <laughs> of people willing to do things that you perhaps don't want to be associated with your larger catch, right? right? Like the larger group that you want to pull as many people into politically. But I was talking to the people at last generation for an episode and they reminded me that it really just takes about historically 3.5% of people to okay. force a change of government. That's interesting. It is because it doesn't seem so daunting. You're not like, you don't have to bring every single person along. Not everybody right. has to look at the work you do and be like, oh, I would do it that way. That's one thing I've embraced that blueprint of disruption right from the beginning. And so does Santiago, where we don't know the right way forward. And there really is no bad tactic, right? What's bad yeah. is limiting the avenues of tactics or confining people into your vision because then you haven't formed a true collective and like we don't know what yeah. socialism looks like for us because we've never involved enough people in what it should look like for us without interference without someone deciding they know best because they've read this book right right we're not going to yeah. base our, our society off of somebody else's writing from a hundred years ago we're going to base it off the needs and the visions of the people who participate in it or it won't work yeah. So you embrace that when you embrace the anarchist perspective of organizing, because then you admit to yourself that the way forward will be forged by the collective that you form. Exactly. Right. Not yeah. by the elected few for, you know, that's these are the institutions that breed problems that yeah. do that that way. So, yeah. Bottom yeah. up, not top down. 
<laughs> it's the only yeah. way to do it. <laughs> and people will say that and still literally be structured like pyramids yeah, that, that's right. um, where the their grassroots base, like their database, is really just that things to mobilize. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's the, like uh it makes me think of like the and I don't I don't necessarily want to say anything negative too negative about like the Communist Party or like uh the PCPL uh, Party for Socialism and Liberation down in the US, uh and that or like Fight Back or any of these organizations that are leftist organizations, but they are often like hierarchical and they have this this is the book, this is what we're following, and this is what you're doing. And I don't think that's how things work. <laughs> no, and I like it's okay that people have a niche, right? We think this is our role. But if you are trying to cast a wide net, then it's foolish to steer all of those people into the same avenues. Right. I think that all like conferences and just attending somebody else's rallies is a solution in itself, right? And to tell people that doing certain things like embracing intersectionality in their organizing is not worth your time. They're counterproductive. <laughs> yeah. so I will say bad things about some of these organizations because they yeah, do have a very narrow view uh, and they're happy to say it. Yeah. No, that's They're right. happy to say, like, I ran into some guy at a rally and he was like literally shitting on the youth that had run that encampment for the last 30 days about their tactics while he was handing out magazines. Right. He felt he was being way more effective. And I, I don't want to be the person to say, <laughs> but I, unfortunately I was because he would not leave me alone. And so I did, but you know, you have to, especially if you're talking about people doing the work, taking risks. Yeah, that's right. Um, I really take issue with folks uh, shitting on them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's, and I see that a lot too on like online discourse is often like that. Like people will be like, Oh no, uh, just stop oil is no good. They're doing things wrong or this person shouldn't have protested in this way. Or those guys shouldn't have done it in that way. And you go, well, what are you doing? You're just tweeting. <laughs> like, I mean, I tweet, I tweet a shit stir myself. So, I mean, there's, well, I, and, there's something but, to it, but like, yeah, to sh just tweeting to shit on people who are out in the street doing things. I don't know. But you've talked to people, I'm sure, and you could hear it, that they are looking for ways to do nothing. Right. Not because they're lazy. I think they're scared. Yep. They aren't doing anything themselves. And so they want to find ways to excuse every possible avenue they could take. And, you know, you're not always going to join up with an organization that is doing groundbreaking stuff, but you're going to make connections. You're going to find out what's for you, what's not for you. Yeah. Uh, and there's no shortage of community groups, in, in, even in the smallest town, That's even true. in the middle of Alberta, Manitoba, where all of these conservative areas, there are local groups that exist, especially now, especially now that people have started Palestinian community groups, uh, sometimes out of other groups that have found new purpose. Right. But um, yeah, a lot of people just... They want a reason why why they don't have to do anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people have never lived in anything other than capitalism. And so sometimes it's very scary to imagine upending a system. And if anybody's from has a family that's lived through revolution or times of political turmoil, that might not be something they're looking forward to either. Right. So, you know, they'd rather just not stir the pot uh, because they're all right, Jack. Right. Like they're. They're not too hard up, but you won't find yeah. anybody that's struggling to feed their family or to house themselves that thinks absolutely nothing is is going to work. And so the, what's the point? Like, Yeah. No, I, I always I think of like uh, back to when I was looking for anarchists and stuff around Regina, I eventually happened upon people who knew of the c cathedral community fridge here in the city. Okay. And like, so there's people doing work that, you know, they don't necessarily label themselves anarchists or, you know, shout from the rooftops that they're, here's some theory to read or whatever, but they're out there doing good work and they're doing things and they're always looking for more help. So 
there's always these organizations around. Everyone who wakes up on a Monday and is like, oh, shit, is an anti-capitalist. They just don't know it yet. Right? <laughs> They're just blaming the wrong thing. You don't hate Monday, right? Isn't that the That's meme? Right. You don't yeah. hate Monday. You hate capitalism. You hate something taking you from your family and what your body and mind would rather be doing with its life here. And you just haven't been, you know, shown those shackles quite clearly. Yeah. But everyone, unfortunately, will get there. But it's just like if we could just get people there before shit gets so bad, it's so obvious. Right. Like that. But time and time again, you talk to people from the Irish Republican Army and who've lived through other uprisings. And it always, unfortunately, kind of has to get to the point where people are so oppressed by a source that is so obvious. Right. It's had to unmask itself clearly, you know. And then the people can work together and push in the right direction yeah. and have uh, liberation in some form. But it's like Canada, we, like, we're not there materially. It's getting bad. It's really bad. You know, it the is yeah. it's growing, but it's like, come on, can we get you there before we get there? Like, can we <laughs> get right. around and be like, okay, I get it. But it's that thing, that human experience people have to have the canon event that, like yeah, it's, fire it's, or whatever it is. Like regularly, me and my partner talk about like how uh, how unsustainable this all is. Like the rent and the bills going up and the cost of groceries. And you go like, when do people notice it, right? Like when does it explode? Because it's not going to fucking last forever. <laughs> but then you tell them to get a vaccine and boom, you have like this little mini explosion. And it's just like, yeah. That's it. That's all we had to do. That was, was, that you was what set go, you off. <laughs> okay. So like, I don't, maybe I don't know how to unlock people, but, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, the, the genocide is, is, is pushing people together, learning new tactics, building networks that weren't there before. And so perhaps it can be an ex somewhat external threat because it's not right. That is the rise of imperialism. And, yeah. you know, we're not free until all of us are free. But perhaps we can experience it through social media, this awfulness that will drive us to kind of behave better politically uh, (laughs) than we have been, you know, putting all our hopes. Like even you're watching in real time in the South as people are opening their eyes after Kamala spoke last night and she is screaming about how the they'll have a more lethal American army moving forward. And you are watching a people who had said, okay, well, she's our only hope, right? It's Trump or, or her. So I, I have to put some hope and you see them turn and go, no, this is not us. This is not for us. We will make no gains with this woman. And that's, that is crushing to get to that point, but it is so freeing to then fully understand that you are not beholden. You don't have to curb your language. You don't have to cozy up to the powerful in really trepid ways that water you down because in the end, it won't matter who's there. Your fight will be the same, clearly. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, it's not your team's not the good team that's going to change everything. It's every politician is doing what, you know, the nasty shit. So we got to keep organize ourselves, I guess. Like, I can't take anybody seriously who's going to hold up. I have one of those signs, you know, with my name on it, the orange signs. It's, I'm not going to show it because, <laughs> but like, I can't take anyone seriously who does that in the background anymore. No. I, even though I was that person and I asked people to be that person, I now look at that and go, are you serious? Right. To what end? To what end? What, what gains do you think you're possibly going to make? It's just harm reduction that we're doing. Yeah. That's like, right. It's just, it's just, I just was saying reduction. that, uh, Maybe. The, I was just saying that the other day about how I can't take anyone seriously if they have, or, and, and please, if I ever do this, somebody fucking smack me, a, a political person's name on your hard hat or hat or car or on your well, you person in say, any way, yeah. <laughs> like, please, how do you do this? Well, you know, I now how feel the same about anybody with the orange that's in. Honestly, I, I think you're just as ridiculous as, as 
this point as the people with fuck Trudeau bumper exactly. stickers. Exactly. That's the same uh, thing. Like you're just cheering, you're just waving That's this right. little flag <laughs> and you are, you're not going to say shit. If you look at some of these people's timelines, they, they will not criticize the party that they're within at yeah. all. It's like they've forgotten how to be activists once they're inside these team sports, right? That's right. Uh, you don't talk shit about your own quarterback unless it's like with your family, right? You don't, you don't <laughs> scream at him on the field, like, or you don't shit talk him on the media. I don't know what it is, but it's like they refuse to be super critical of the people representing them especially when they win right yeah. it becomes worse when they That's win right. yeah. and so scared of losing power how could you say that or the people being attacked for being trump supporters they've got socialist flags in their bio everything you could possibly say <laughs> i fuck politics at this point and and you'll you'll be accused of being a trump supporter if you mention that kamala harris supports a genocide or that right. she has kept people in prison past the release date so she can use their free labor like, no, no, we, we're going to wait till like, November. Just facts. Like, gonna... just facts. <laughs> and you get accused of being a fucking Trump supporter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because there is no good time or place either, right? People say, well, there's almost an election or it's during an election or there might be a leadership race and save it for convention. Like, don't, <laughs> this, you know, or the election's too far party. away. Why are you talking about it now? <laughs> yeah, but then you show up to convention and it's still, who do they have on the mic? They have the MPs, the MPPs, the same yeah. people you've been listening to for the last two, three years, right? Who yeah. I, no one gets a say in anything. So. Yeah, free yourself from those spaces, people. Run, <laughs> run. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I got you to fill out my my questionnaire, so uh, I, I'm, we might as well use a couple of them. Uh, so for foes and comrades, for foes, you put the NDP, which I think I've explained myself. Yeah, I think I think throughout this episode we've established that the NDP is, in fact, our foe if we actually are radical, right? I don't know what else to say about it, except that, like, yeah, party politics is bad, even if it's the supposedly progressive party. Oh, people, maybe they want to start a new party. Yeah, people are doing that. And, you know, people pushing forward. I get it. Uh, but always remember, you're still back to the same discussion, Corey, and I had near the beginning where you're still going to have to play these games if your ultimate goal is to win an election if your yeah. goal is to build community and networks like you can still be a community org and enter a race or two until you think there's a purpose but you know independents here in canada don't get shit in terms of like legislature so how much energy and resources you're going to put into that yeah you know is 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 not cool but you know, go ahead form new parties but make them more look more like your Black Panthers, you know, right, than, right. than your Green Party or whatever you've got locally. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think because there's, there's stories, right? You think uh, like about the history of the socialist movements and, and whatnot. And you, you see like the social Democrats, they go and they, they win enough seats to get into power, but only if they team up with the fucking centrist parties <laughs> yeah yeah we and, did an episode on that it was disheartening because you're we trying to find like how to make socialists uh farmers socialists again you know how we can that's really where conservatives <laughs> yeah. get a lot of their votes and you hear the old stories of you know finding victory but in that circumstance that you describe exactly and then that implodes because <laughs> you know principled people don't like that and yeah so yeah yeah it's struggle it's a struggle indeed. Yeah, even uh, like what happened in France, kind of, where they all kind of had to team up to fucking defeat the fascists. Like, well, the radical friend side of those pe that group is not going to get what they want, right? No, because they exist in a parliament that is almost one third centrist and one third far right. Yeah. But it was a demonstration what? of what you can kind of maneuver around politically. But I talked, you know, I brought Jeremy Appel in to the studio because he wrote a piece on this and I just did not agree with him. And in the end, I think we both came to the same conclusion that, you know, you can try coalition building or whatnot, but in the end, even that is harm reduction and unlikely to get the ends that yeah. you were originally going for. But stopping the far right is a priority it there will sure be is. a substantive difference between trudeau and poliev 
especially when it comes to our comrades in the streets, right? And how they will be treated and how the relationship with Israel will be. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that is something yeah. to stop. Yeah, it's interesting, like comparing U.S. to Canada, like the liberals almost are more liberal than the Democrats in that sense. <laughs> like, like, I think there is a bigger difference between the conservative party and the liberal party than there is between the Republicans and the Democrats, at least in terms of foreign policy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hate making the comparison, but. I, Kamala feels a lot like when Barack Obama, like no one was really excited about Biden. They just wanted to stop Trump. But yeah. people genuinely got excited about Obama and he exploded the drone program. He right. exasperated the so-called migrant crisis and started building those detention centers. Uh, so and then you got people again believing in the Democratic Party, which takes a while to pull them back out of it. Some of them are still rubbing their eyes and trying to find their way out of that because there's really no alternative to them, you know, until yeah. plugged in, right? Until you see people plugged into groups like tenant organizing or, you know, stop cop city, all there's all kinds of movements. People are joining that are very locally oriented that have allowed them to get out of politics like that. You yeah. know, was it Cory Bush just lost her seat and in her speech was just like, that's all right. You just, you, you know, you just freed me from all of the confines that I mean, yeah. she behave as though she had many confines, but I'm sure she felt those <laughs> pressures all the time. And AOC clearly felt them. She's fully establishment now. Yeah, she's so, folded pretty hard, eh? Yeah. I, does she still have that eat the rich dress she wore to the Met Gala? <laughs> uh, she can burn that. Like no yeah. one's buying that shit anymore. No. So if they if they were then. No, that's exactly right. Which I guess brings us you mentioned tenant organizing, which brings us to your comrades. Uh so tenant unions. Yeah. Like folks, oh, there's <laughs> people on rent strike. There are people that are so fed up that have built a union within their apartment buildings, especially in these urban centers where apartment buildings are owned, a lot of them by the same company. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily gain a threshold within one building, but you can build on all of the buildings because they're going to be treating all of the folks the same and people are fed up. And there's above rent board, above board rent increases getting approved like no problem, even right. under a progressive mayor here in Toronto. And so, yeah, actually on Tuesday, I get to interview folks that have had some victories at the board where like the nice. judge, they went in front of the judge and the judge was just like, you've got to be kidding me. You fix up this building right fucking now before we even start talking about getting those people to pay you rent again. Because, and they really are demonstrating what happens when you get together and find people as pissed off as you are and make sure it's at the same person. You know, the landlord is a clear opponent to these people. He, you know, the building managers there at their door harassing them, evicting, trying to evict their neighbors. People are stopping some of these evictions. And yeah, just every day at Vancouver has a lot of them as well. They, you see them forming. Mm -hmm. Acorn Canada does a lot of work organizing tenants loosely as well, either building by building or by community. And that is exactly where eventually we have to be, right? We all need to be in community unions if we want the vision that most people have of our yeah. future, right? And so that's how it's going to be done, right? By the people around you. We can't wait for our homeowners to organize. Like, yeah. uh, you know, if you are one, great. You can you could still mobilize, but uh, make sure you're also assisting those tenant unions. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. the I was briefly a member of the DSC or Democratic Socialists of Canada. And uh, they were doing, that was something that they were really focusing on in, in Regina was like the tenant organizing. They were going from, they had like certain buildings that they had talked, spoken to all the tenants in, and they were talking about actually doing rent strikes and thinking about that. It's something that I don't have any previous experience with, but I've always been curious about how, how it works. It's something that, yeah, no, I find it very interesting. 
Well, we did an episode, we called it Blueprints of a Run Strike. And we were lucky enough to have Bruno on from the York Southwest in Tenant Union. And this man is pure fire. Every word he speaks is working class solidarity. Nice. I, it's, a, it's an experience speaking to Bruno. And that's who I'll get to talk to again on, on Tuesday, along with one of the leaders from the buildings. And one of the points that he drove home and all of the best organizers drive home, uh, the Najwan Support Network uh, is another great example where they will insist and emphasize that you don't organize people, they organize themselves. Mm. And so you can't go into a building and organize it into a tenant union. You need to make friends and create third spaces where people can just be people with one another. Because in an apartment yeah. building, that's very rare. You know, maybe you meet them in the laundry room. There's very few outdoor spaces that are, are you know, those are depleting. And so you, you kind of have to create them. So outdoor movies or other things and make those connections. And then as you talk to each other, you will naturally find what the problem is, who is causing it. And you will discuss ways that you can make it stop, yeah. right? And you'll walk each other through each one of those steps as you escalate, right? Because you'll uh, everyone will want to start with writing a strongly worded letter. You can't bring everyone to the burn it down phase right away or run straight away. <laughs> okay. like that won't happen. Yeah, sometimes you sign up half your building, and and but that is enough. That is a lot of pressure uh, sure. put on a landlord or the property manager to get one by one what you need. Sometimes it's big things. Sometimes it's just like little things for your neighbors, like work orders that have not been completed. But you shouldn't be going at that one on one because you know that your neighbor has another work order that needs helping. And the Naja One Support Network is like that too. It's, it talks to workers, non unionized workers. It is a network of non unionized workers. They don't talk to, they are one and the same. And they understand the value of solidarity in that we win your fight against this employer and then you will help me with my fight against this other employer because like they, there are employers taking real advantage of international students and folks with precarious status here in Canada in terms of immigration status and whatnot. And so uh, and not every workforce is capable of unionizing. You know, people move around a lot at turnover. So it's but there are unions of these workers, these kind of various workers from all kinds of different workplaces that have formed a network that will go outside of a boss's house and for stage weekly protests, put up posters with their face on it. And uh, uh, I'm going to get the language wrong, but they, you know, they have a name, a derogatory name that they call them. Uh, I think it's in Tamil, but um, <laughs> you know, they, high pressure, high pressure tactics, you know, things that a lot of people are like, well, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. No, they just go full throttle a lot of the time and they get, they get it done. They have recouped so much in unpaid wages because these folks are just like, stop paying people. What do you do if it's just you? You're new to Canada, you know, like a handful of people. But, uh, you know, when you look, you find these networks, these networks and they're incredible. That's fantastic. I, uh, I think I have more questions for you, but we're coming up on an hour, so we better better call it. Um, so I guess, is there anything that you want to talk about that we haven't talked about? Yeah, I want people to just take care of themselves out there. Burnout is absolutely real. I kind of joked about it earlier, but we are going on plus 10 months of witnessing a genocide in real time amongst a planet burning shitty politicians and we can't pay our bills. And so I tell people to fight, 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 fight all the time, get in the streets, like, you know, do what you can. But I don't spend enough time, I think, reminding people that rest is revolutionary as as well. And although it is completely pressing, If you have time to listen to my podcast or even scroll through how many episodes there are, know that every single one of those episodes behind that is a network of people that are working constantly. So you can take a breath. You can take a moment because you're definitely not doing this by yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you haven't plugged into anywhere because you don't have the energy, you don't have the resources, the time, that is okay. That is okay because we will create mutual aid, 
mutual aid networks out there that will allow more of our neighbors to be able to breathe and have that spare time so that they can get out there. So, you know, there are steps you can take with very limited resources, but yeah, uh, really the podcast that we do is aimed at encouraging folks to just take some sort of avenue, right? And to just start to question the narratives around them, but so that they can really upend that status quo, you know, like, right? yeah, don't give in, but also don't push yourself to limits where you're useless to us because this is a long fight. It makes me yeah. mad though to think about it that way, you know, like it's for my kids or, and I say in our lifetime when I talk about a free Palestine and I want to believe that we will have a free Palestine in our lifetime, but the changes that we need wholly, you know, we may not experience, you may not right. experience. So that's hard to push through sometimes. Yeah, it's maybe good to focus on something like uh, like a specific goal like that, like organize your particular building or organize your community in a certain way, or even like, say, like the bigger free Palestine movements, rather than being like, we're going to transform society into an anarchist horizontal power structure. <laughs> yeah, right now. Yeah, <laughs> because one of those things can happen sooner than the others. <laughs> You got well. You got to live it, right? Like people need to experience yeah. and live it before they can replicate it in larger scales. So anybody finding avenues, anti-capitalist avenues, right? Even when they don't know it, you know what I mean. When you find these groups that you like, you're amongst them, and or I'm sitting with them, going, "Are you guys anarchists?" And they're like, "What?" They're like, no, <laughs> right. But you know, I'll listen. I'm I'm here for this. So yeah. they're they're there. People are pushing back all over the place in like different ways. So yeah, encourage sure. that shit. All right. Where can people find you? Well, Blueprints of Disruption, we're BP of Disruption on Instagram and Twitter. My handle, I don't even know my handle. I think I'm just <laughs> slash underscore, no, underscore McLean. Yeah. So just a underscore McLean on Twitter. That's hey. where I get most of my venting out. You might, might be amused, but please give Blueprints of Disruption a shot. It is my labor of love as uh, well as uh, you can hear Santiago. <laughs> no, and it's, it's in my opinion, a very, very good show for anyone who's interested in radical politics. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me, Corey. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. All right, folks, that's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share the show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie at Hope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a Substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I'd like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my link tree. It's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video, join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. 